I want to situate this interview. I want to date it. Yeah. So you had um, some really great news this week. You had um, five nominations at the European Film Awards. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about one specific nomination. Yeah. And if this is a nomination that pleases you or makes you the most happy, it's for Best Actor. Yeah. Your actor is going up against another A24 film, which is a big deal. Yeah, it is, really, it is a really, really important one. Because when I saw Aiden for the first time sitting on the train, uh, I mean, I felt that there was something really incredible ab about this young human being, but I also at the same time didn't know. And then when he came to that first casting round, I just, everyone who was in that space, my brother, my uh, our co-writer, uh, one of our, my best friends who's also the child coach on this film, mm -hmm. we were all blown away by him because he had this attitude he was there and he had this attitude that he wanted this part and he was going to, to, to put everything of him inside of that role. And so he surprised us like from that very first moment. I, I think they both did mm -hmm. and, uh, and I feel like what Aiden did is also so very much linked to what Gustav did. Mm -hmm. I feel like they did that, they created that friendship that's at the core of it together. Um, and I do feel like what was so special with them from the beginning is that there was a real sense of collaboration. Like they were horizontal, like one wanted to do as good as the other. Um, but I am very proud of what they do in this film. I'm very proud of Eden. I think Eden really is an actor. I mean, he's studying to become a, a dancer, mm -hmm. uh, so someone who translates emotion through the body and through the ways of ex expression. I think that's also people that I gravitate towards very naturally because I had this dream of becoming a dancer before becoming a filmmaker. And I think in many ways our cinematic language is very much in the unspoken. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he's recognized mm -hmm. because I feel like he became a co-author of this film. I feel like there was the script and then there was what he did with it. And I think he has this sensibility and this artistry at that young age that I do feel um, is incredibly complex mm -hmm. and incredibly um, important to this piece. I think it, I consider it to be a piece of all of us, of this whole team, but especially also of him. And being in a category with Paul Mescal, I mean, seriously. When you were on the Crozet on press day, um, you know, they take all the pictures and whatnot. And I was, I was, I was seeing pictures of you on the screen. I said, so what is he, what are you reminding me of? Like, what's the image I was getting? And I was thinking of Jimmy Dean from Rebel Without a Cause. He had like this bright red shirt, yeah. the t-shirt tucked. And I was thinking about that. Um, and it's funny because you bathe your characters in close uh, with uh, magenta, uh, but the color red is a strong visual motif here in that film. It is here today in, in some way. Mm -hmm. um, the tulip fields are being shredded up. They're being replanted. Love is brutal. Love is vast. It's all mm -hmm. encompassing. Mm -hmm. How does Lucas Don think about color and specifically what were you looking to achieve here with that palette that you chose? Yeah. Well, I think that when I was young, uh, I think creativity and, and beauty was always something that I tried to look for and flee in a little bit because it was my way out of reality. A reality in which I think uh, the conflict between the body I was born in and the expectations that came with that in our society was very omnipresent in my young life. And so creativity, beauty, other, people, other people's worlds and aesthetics was something that I always looked for in order to disappear in them. Uh, I think as a teenager, universes like Wong Kar Wai's, mm -hmm. uh, Xavier Dolan's, it's, it's a universe in which light color all lead up and add to the narration and to the characters created in their films. Um, I also think that because 
my very first dream, like I said, was that of a dancer. Uh, and so when I write scripts, I think I much more approach them from that choreographer point of view uh, than from a scriptwriter point of view. Mm -hmm. I write uh, images, colors, lights, sounds, costumes, much more than I write written text. So everything happens already by the unspoken. And in these images, of course, everything is important. So next to the static quality that I look for and this idea in my professional and personal life to keep looking for beauty where I can, even when life gets maybe darker, there is this sense of using these visual elements to speak. Um, and I think one of the first images, for example, for this film that came was the image of two boys running in between flower fields. And, and, and it's an image because I feel like it says a lot about this theme of childhood. Mm -hmm. It's like this, for me, this iconic image of boys in between this, in this color book, like this image of innocence. And that color that gets chopped off the fields by these machines that arrive and these flowers that get cut and this tonality that changes to more like a brown, it is a way of expressing the dramaturgy of the film in which there is a fragile part and a brutal part and the brutal slowly corrupts the fragile. And so I feel like the, the, the setting is showing me that without saying it. Uh, at the same, and it's at the, in the same way that I think of color throughout the film, that I think of the contraposition between, for example, that room that is a sort of safe haven, that is a safe space for them, but then also slowly transforms into a, a place of utter brutality. Um, and, for example, the world of, of hockey, where everything is black, they're all black, they're like this flock of birds all trying to go into the same direction and this character is in amidst them and trying to follow their movements. So I feel when I approach um, characters and teams, I feel like it is organic for me to think of, to, to think of meaning in that way. It is not very organic for me to hear them talk. Mm -hmm. then I force myself to let them talk because otherwise it would be dance performances and not films. But it's much more organic for me to approach it from that very expressionist choreographer point of view. What a, what a really great way to look at life. Uh, like that prism, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of touched by, uh, by how, how you frame things. Yeah, I think it's, the, for me, there's this, this importance and this necessity of art and it's, it's opening, opening doors, literally opening windows to the world and to our inner selves by reflecting and showing, um, showing among many things, the, the, the possible beauty of life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with paintings, that is something that has always done that for me. I, I remember being like 16 and discovering Henry Scott Duke, who's of course one of Britain's more important painters and queer and who expressed the desire without ever having these bodies touched, but just two bodies painted watching another body in the ocean. And, and like, there is beauty and desire coming from that painting mm -hmm. and a desire that I connected to maybe before I could express it. There's this great Altman-esque zoom shot where you announce that the proximity felt and the rapport between these two characters might be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a small, if you, if you blink, you might not notice it, but there is a performance there how they sort of like clutch to each other in a way like, like, hey, we have to go into this big bad world yeah. in a way. It's very telling about their dynamic. And you follow this with, uh, I could say that your, your cinema is observational. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this assortment of shots where the camera isolates Leo within a group. Um, but, but, but what I found is by the end, not every sequence, not every shot, um, 
has the end goal of capturing Leo's mindset. There's a lot of time where he's, he's just fluttering in the, cl in the, in the crowd. Um, well, I think that when building up uh, like the bigger, uh, let's say, blocks of, 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 of the film, mm -hmm. I think that, so the first title of the film before calling it close was We Two Boys Together Clinging. It's based on a Walt Whitman poem and David Hockney had a painting that was also called that because he was so inspired by the Walt Whitman poem. And it's actually how I see the very first 15 minutes of the film in which you follow this like fusional sensual friendship of two boys that are literally one human like one being they're completely entangled you say that like that entangled yes i hope it's a word and um and then there's this rupture when we see them go to um to La lycée. To, to yeah, to, to school together for the first time. And so all of a sudden, that very, that world that too, that we had spent the first 15 minutes in, all of a sudden the camera for the first time moves out and shows them within the jungle of this playground. And I mean, a playground for all of us is this space where we are confronted for the first time in our lives with the fact that society is divided into groups and each group come with its expectations, its codes. And I think that, I mean, the verticality of our society is clear, starts to become clear in that moment in time. And for me, it's been, I mean, in my personal life, it's been an incredibly confronting moment in time. And I, I do want to represent that on screen so creating that jungle all of a sudden that happens and that that fragile connection that that we lose in a sense in mm -hmm. it is um, was an important visual translation of that idea I think also the film in in in, in that first part really slowly pulls these creates more distance between these characters and then I'm, I'm talking about it from a very technical point of view but like in mise-en-scene but also in use of lenses they start to be separated more and more and their 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 literal pathways start to shift and move uh, further and further and further away from each other then I think there's another part that starts because the dramaturgy of this it's really a film that that restarts. Mm -hmm. It's a film that exists out of two parts. It's a film that moves through dark and, and reopens. And I feel like in the second part, there is, we, we stay with one of the characters w going through a very specific process of heartbreak, stuck in a, a costume, in an armor, sometimes literally, sometimes not literally, that doesn't allow any emotion to come in and out anymore. So there's an approach to the image, there's an approach to what we perceive and what we cannot perceive anymore that was important to work out in the visual and not only visual, also on auditive world around building it around this character. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is, I mean, I, I have a chance to, to have, I work with an incredible team of many people who are very close to me and Frank van der Neden who's a cinematographer of this film who I've worked with for the previous one he is someone who I think very comes in very early on in the script phase and reads different drafts of the scripts yeah and I, it's important to me because I feel in that way he's he comes to understand what stayed and what didn't stay and he comes to understand much about the writing by by understanding what made it and what didn't yeah and i feel like it's a, a good preparation for attacking our work that we do together on the mise-en-scene um, because the reasoning behind everything becomes clear very early on and then he may does his own thing with it unless it's a teacher you choose all your your, your relationships this is not a relationship that he chose 
But it's such an interesting dynamic. It opens up a can of worms that is so fascinating. I, I'm just relating to my own life. I remember when my friend's parents got divorced and I didn't see them as parents anymore. I didn't see them as Charlie Brown figures. I saw them as very complex, layered characters. You have this close proximity to a person that should be a stranger, but isn't. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to get a sense of how exciting it was for, for yeah. em 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 um, sorry, Emily. Yeah to get a text like this and to yeah. see all the, the, how stacked it is. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, what you say. I really resonate with what you say because I feel like when you're young, you have your friends and then you have the parents of your friends. And I remember, I have this vivid memory of the mother of one of my best friends and this sort of closeness to her because there's a sort of intimacy shared with a, a, another adult that is not your parents, that you also have a sort of generosity for that you don't always have for your parents at that moment in time, mm -hmm. that is very uh, incredibly beautiful, actually, I find. Um, because in many ways, it's adults that you look at as human beings because your parents m many times you look at them as your parents but it's actually the, one of the first adults that you really start to observe as adults mm -hmm. going through this world dealing with all uh, all these these themes that adults deal with um, so that was an important one for me to put in this film um, I think that she also says something I find very beautiful because she calls him fils de coeur, right. which is like exa exactly how I feel that relationship is described. It's not her biological son, but it's someone who's constantly there. And so someone she starts to love also because he is so connected to her. Um, I think that with Emily de Ken, for me, I mean, she is a little bit, I find our Kate Winslet's. Our Belgian kid, she is like a power. I mean, you cannot go around Emily de Ken. When Emily de Ken is in a movie, she is there. She's, there's a humanity, there's an, 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 an emotionality to her that I find is very, very strong. And I know from seeing her in other films, from seeing her in Rosetta, where she of course plays at the age of 17 for the first time, but also in uh, the Joachim Lafosse film, A Père de la Raison, and actually in many of the things, I know she dives right in to emotion. And uh, she was, when I presented her the text, she was very, very intrigued uh, and, and maybe even more because what we talked about very early on was that I was much more interested when it came to this character uh, by exploring implosion than mm -hmm. explosion. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a character, and of course the character is also linked to the idea of tragedy, in which we would maybe previsibly be more used to seeing explosion. And I, actually, I, the idea of not doing that, the idea of having this woman with an armor on, actually in many ways like this main protagonist in this ice hockey costume, this woman who doesn't publicly want to show anything, who doesn't want to let the world see her emotion, was something that I think um, excited us. And I knew that she's that type of actress that even though when you say, hold it back, mm -hmm. that, sh that that face that that those eyes will transmit it anyway yeah. so I feel like that is the power of Emily de Ken is that she's just she dives into a part and she made us feel the interior world of that woman happening in that moment even if she, even when she asks if, if Leo is thirsty there's there's yeah. there's, there's yeah. a complexity just in that yeah. scene and what I, what I wrote down in my notes is um, she's dependent on um, Leo, uh, Leo's um, 
she's at Leo's mercy for information. Yeah. And what's interesting about Leo is he is almost looking to her much later on in the film as if he's coming to confession and she's a priest. Yeah. And he, he's he's going through. It's it's a really interesting dynamic. So, and as a final question, you're probably going to get this asked by a billion other journalists: is what you're working on next? That's not the question I'm asking you now. Uh huh. Um, That's good because I learned never speak too soon about what you're doing never, because I changed a lot of ideas before. And I, and I get super excited, but what I'm curious about is what does a quotidien, when this film is done and gone in the month of March, let's say, and you're on your final film festivals and you have enough trophies to put on different IKEA shelves at home, whatnot, what, is that, what does that time off look like for you? How do you think creatively, but also how do you just exist? Like, what does a day for Lucas Don look like when you're not creating, when you, when you don't have a blank page in front yeah. of you? Well, it's, it's what, what immediately comes to mind when you say that is I, of course, in many interviews, I talk about friendship and the importance and the fragility of it. In a moment in my, t in my life where I don't see any of my friends. And so I'm constantly talking about connection, but being very disconnected. Um, so there's a sort of duality to that that is really interesting. I do think that if when I come back home and when this film is in the world, I think that that is what it will look like first, is like spending time with my close ones, with my loved ones, because I know how fragile those mm -hmm. relationships are. Um, spending time with my, with, yeah, like with the people in my life. And then I feel like every film, I started, in the beginning, I started to, to have plural ideas at the same time, to try to develop them and do. And maybe that's something that I will understand later how to do. But I also feel like with every film you transform so much, there's really a before and an after. And even my desires of when I started close and now as a human being and a filmmaker are so different. And so, when you meet, and it's really, when you meet all the audiences that respond in many different ways to your film, it's like understanding it from the other side. Um, and it gives you so much new knowledge mm -hmm. about yourself and about what you do and why you do it in that way. So I think I will dissect that a little bit when I have the time to really have clarity to think of why certain things are the way they are and then try to continue in a way that feels like we're continuing something important to us and in the way that we feel like we're renewing something for an audience. Lucas, you have a, a, a lot of mileage in front of you. Um, that passport, I hope it's, uh, it's, I it's renewed got extra it. pages. I renewed it. Um, thank you so much for your time. And, thank you so and much. And we look forward to the theatrical release and all the stuff that's going to happen in your near future. So, thank you so merci much. Beaucoup. Merci Eric. Hey, this is Eric from MyOnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.